Well, I'm pretty pumped up today. We get to tackle one of my favorite topics in, in the entire uh, Calc 1 and Calc 2 curriculum, and that's related rates. And I think it's just so practical, and you can just see it unfolding in your everyday life. But uh, here are the three general guidelines that I want to pose to you that are really going to help you be successful here today and really dominate this type of question. And first of all, it's just a matter of picking an equation that includes all the variables in play. You know, ask yourself, you know, what, you know, what all is changing as the problem plays out. I like to think of these related rate problems as if they were like a movie. You know, we were watching them on, a, you know, on TV. And then there's a certain moment where we hit the pause button and we ask ourselves, okay, at this one instantaneous moment, you know, at what rate is the radius changing or at what rate is this length changing or something like that. So a lot of times it's going to be up to you to pick the appropriate equation that includes all the variables. For instance, if we had a ladder sliding down the wall and we're talking about the length of this side and the length of that side, et cetera, et cetera, then it's pretty much going to be Pythagorean theorem. But the moment that I start talking about an angle there, Okay, we've got this triangle, and the moment we start to include angles, it's no longer Pythagorean theorem, but now we need to pick the most logical trig function, okay, and so forth. Now, number two is by far the most important. The only numerical substitutions that are allowed, all right, the only numerical substitutions allowed is for constants only at the beginning of the question. There's absolutely no numerical substitutions for what for variables all right this is a big no no until after you have done what till after you've derived so it's a matter of you know you might have two variables in there still go ahead use your product rule quotient rule whatever you need to do and then once you've derived then you can start to plug the numerical values in um, but do watch out for constants if a lot of these problems do have constants hiding in them uh, for instance when you go back to that ladder problem as the ladder slides down the wall the hypotenuse is a constant so you can go ahead and plug that one in instantly at the beginning before you derive and so forth but by the time you do get ready to derive it's always with respect to t um, when we start talking about rates here it's with respect to time. So I think we're ready to jump in and we'll kind of get the rust off and see if we can't dominate this topic. All right, for our four examples tonight, I, uh, I just used the iPad to take a picture of the problems that were in our uh, Princeton Review book. So if you have any trouble reading the, the print here, you're more than welcome to open up your book and, and follow along. But basically it says a circular pool of water is expanding at a rate of 16 pi inches squared per second. At what rate is the radius expanding when the radius is four? So again, it's like you're watching this movie. Maybe you threw a stone out in the pond and there's you see these ripples expanding and so which value did they just give us here a lot of times the units will tell you the whole story inches squared represents area so when it's inches squared per second now that's the rate at which the air is changing so they have told us that da dt and i use a capital a here is 16 pi inches squared per second how many times have you seen a related race question on a fun quiz on Wednesday this year? You did everything right, and you just didn't have the label on at the end. It's really heartbreak hotel. So watch out. Make sure you carry these units with you, and, and just be cognizant of the fact that we need units on our, our final answer, of course. Now, as you're watching this movie play out, we're watching this circle grow, and then at the moment when the radius is 4, we hit that pause button right away. So what, um, what equation are we going to pick out here? Well, I'm going to say that the area of a circle is pi times r squared. Are there any constants? No. Area is growing. Radius is growing. There are no constants here um, ex except for the, uh, you know, of course, pi is. Now, the derivative, we're going to say that dA dt equals 2 times pi times r to the first times dr dt. So some real good implicit differentiation right there. Now that we've derived, we're allowed to substitute the appropriate values. We're going to say 16 pi equals 2 pi times the radius at this particular moment is 4. And then dr dt is the uh, value we would like to solve for. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, I like it. I love it when those pi's cancel. 16 divided by 8 is 2. So I'm going to say 2 what? That's the kicker. 2, let's go inches per second inches per second is the rate at which the radius is increasing at the one moment when r equals four inches. 
Oh, I absolutely love this second question. This is a very, very typical AP question, one that we're very likely to see on the multiple choice of the exam. So here's what they've done. The first sentence says a spherical balloon is expanding at a rate of 60 pi inches cubed per second. So what they've done is they've described the rate at which what is changing. That's right, they just gave you dv dt. They told you that the volume is changing at a rate of 60 pi inches cubed. And the cubic is what really gives it away. As soon as, as soon as you see the cubic units, you know it's something to do with volume. Now here's the booger of the, of the problem though. They ask us at what rate or how fast is the surface area of the balloon expanding at the moment when the radius is four. So you've got a formula that relates volume to the radius but then we need to relate the radius to the surface area. So we're kind of going to you know, use one equation to get to the other, so to speak. I'm going to start off by saying I know that the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. All right, And that's one we need to stick that in your back pocket, make sure we know that. Um, v and r are both variables, so I'm going to go ahead and derive it right now. dv dt is now equal to 4 times pi times r squared times dr dt. Again, some good implicit differentiation. I'm going to use this formula to solve for dr dt. And once, once I get my hands on dr dt, I can then use that to attack um, and find the rate at which the surface area is changing. So we could say 60 pi equals 4 pi. At this moment, when the radius is 4, Oh, goodness gracious, what do we got here? Love it when the pi's cancel. 4 times 16, 64. So maybe 60 over 64, and that would be inches per second, and that's the rate at which the radius is changing. Now it's time to graduate to surface area. Now the surface area of a sphere is just 4 pi r squared. Oh, what a weird quinky thing. Um, the uh, two-dimensional measurement is just the derivative of the three-dimensional measurement of volume, and that just leads us into a whole other discussion of why calculus-based physics is, is uh, significantly easier at times just because all the formulas are just derivatives or antiderivatives of each other. But anyway, so their surface area, the derivative of surface area with respect to time is going to be 8 pi um, r to the first dr dt. Try to squeeze this in there. Uh, dA dt is what we're solving for. We want 8 times pi. The radius right now is 4. And the dr dt, if we re you're more than welcome to leave it as 60 over 64. You could reduce it to 15 sixteenths. Oh, let's see. Uh, let's see. 8 makes that a 2. That makes that a 2. I think the rate at which the surface area is changing is 30 pi inches squared per second. Make sure we add inches squared to go along with area and of course per seconds to describe the time. So we've got the the very typical cone problem here and they're talking about a cone that is kind of positioned like this, some kind of underground water tank here and uh, the volume of that cone is going to be one-third pi r squared h. Now the thing that's a little bit alarming here is that volume is being expressed in terms of both the radius and the height of the cone, two variables. Now you're thinking calculus wise that doesn't really scare me. Um, you know I can certainly do the product rule here between r squared and h. I could work my way through it but then I'm all gonna, by the time I get done with the product rule with respect to time I'm going to have both a dr dt and a dh dt in the outcome and I just don't have enough information given to me in this problem to handle all of those unknowns. So what I'm going to try to do, because as the water fills up, okay, let's say you know it's not very full here at the beginning, what, the cross section creates a nice triangle. And as the water fills and it continues to create more triangles, all of these triangles are similar to each other. Therefore, the ratio between the radius and the height is a constant. And so that's what we always try to take advantage of that ratio to make my derivative easier. I'm always going to try to set up a ratio. I'm going to, for instance, I'm going to say that the radius r is to h as, let's see, the tank has a height of 30 and a radius of 15. So I'm going to say 15 is to 30. And then I'm going to you know, cross multiply and eventually solve for one of those variables. Now which one, I'm not sure yet because I haven't finished reading the question. Now the question says, how fast is the water level rising at the moment when it's 12 feet deep? So ultimately they're asking me here for, for dh dt. If I'm going to answer that question, I need to eliminate the r's. I'm going to solve for r. r is h over 2 or 1 half h. I'm going to substitute that in there. 
So now we can say that volume is really one-third pi times h over 2 squared times h. Again, no big rush to take a derivative. Let's just clean it up. I've got one twelfth times pi times h cubed. Um, hopefully you see where the one twelfth came from. Now that I've expressed volume strictly in terms of h, I think I'm ready to take his derivative. dv dt equals, let's see, 3 times 1 twelfth is really 1 fourth times pi times h squared times dh dt. Again, some real nice implicit differentiation. And what kind of information did they give me? Well, they said the tank's being filled at a rate of 18 pi feet squared per or feet cubed per minute. So right there, that's my dv dt. Again, the cubic units kind of gives it away, says, says that we're describing volume. We've got our one-fourth, we've got our pi. It's When are we hitting the pause button on this movie? We're going to hit the pause button at the moment when h is 12. And now I'm just ready to solve for dh dt. If you hear a lot of crazy commotion going on, uh, Bailey's been getting a little restless and he's just been doing all sorts of crazy stuff. But uh, nonetheless, we'll... Stay focused here. Um, let's see, we gotta kill the pies. Um, let's see, 144 times 1 fourth. Let's see, that's gonna be about 36. And I divide the 36 over, so 18 over 36, which is, yeah, that's 1 half. What am I thinking? And that's dhdt. So what are the units gonna be on this one? I think we're gonna say feet, that describes height, per minute, that describes time. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the rate at which the height and that cone is changing. Here's a real nice triangle problem, and anytime you deal with a triangle problem, you're like, okay, can I get away with the Pythagorean theorem, or do I have to start to use a trig function? And that's the key here. But we've got a rocket that's rising vertically at a rate of 5,400 miles per hour. So I'm starting to picture this, okay, rockets rising vertically. Uh, so we said if this is called h, then we know that dh dt is going to be 5,400 miles per hour. An observer on the ground standing 20 miles from the launch point. So we've got 20 miles right there. I'm going to call that B for base. So I've got my base and my height. And he's standing right here. We'll draw a little stick figure for the observer. How fast in radians per second is the angle of elevation between the ground and the, and the observer's line of sight of the rocket increasing? So here's the line of sight. You're watching the rocket rise, so they're describing this theta right here. And they want to know how many radians per second is that angle increasing. So the moment that you start to talk about an angle, we know that it's got to be some trig. And um, let's see, are all the sides changing, aka variables, or are there constants here? Um, I know that the base is a constant, but the other two are variables. So I'm going to try to pick up pick a trig function that not only uses h but also takes advantage of the base because it's a constant. I want to take advantage of that constant if I can and tangent works out beautifully. So the tangent of angle theta is equal to h over b. Now theta is a variable so I have to leave that as theta. However the base is a constant so I'm going to substitute, I'm going to say 1 20th times h. You could say h over 20, but I think derivative-wise, it makes more sense to write it as 1 20th times h. So now, don't forget we got to use chain rule, some good implicit on the left side. We're going to say secant squared of theta times, and this is the most important part, d theta dt, equals 1 20th times dh dt. All right, we're cooking. Yeah, let's see, what do we got here? Now I'm solving for d theta dt. So as I isolate that rascal, I'm going to say that d theta dt is really 1 20th times dh dt times cosine squared. Having a secant squared on the left is equivalent to having a cosine squared on the right. Now I don't even need to know theta. I don't care what theta is. I can tell you the cosine of theta by looking at my triangle. So you ask, well, how are you going to know the cosine of theta? Well, they said, when are we going to hit the pause button? They said, I want to know the rate at which theta is changing at the moment when h equals 40 miles. Okay. So at that particular moment in time, if I do a little Pythagorean theorem, 20 squared plus 40 squared, I'm going to get radical 2,000 for the length of that hypotenuse. Now, based off of that, I could say, let's see, dh dt is unknown. I could say that the cosine of that angle is, let's see, adjacent over hypotenuse, let's say 20 over radical 2,000. And that's getting squared, so that'll be nice and kill the radical. Now the only other bear trap here is that uh, describing dhdt, you think, well, what's the big deal? It's just 5,400, right? Well, here's the problem. 
they have, um, they said they wanted to know the rate at which they, theta is changing in radians per second. Did you catch that? Per second part. So that means I have to describe dh dt in miles per second. All right, so we're just going to go over some units analysis really quick from your previous science career. Let's see, if we have 5,400 miles per one hour, let's see, we've got one hour is equivalent to 60 minutes, so I'm going to multiply that, and then I've got one minute is equivalent to 60 seconds. All right, so basically it's 5,400 over 3,600, which reduces really nice to three halves. So dHdt is actually three halves miles per second, and that's what I'm going to substitute for dHdt. So we're almost there. We're coming down the home stretch now. So let's throw our three halves in there. Let's go ahead. If we multiplied all those rascals together, we'd end up with three two hundreds radians per second. That's the rate at which theta is changing. Okay, we got to sneak in one more, and um, we'll try to do this as efficiently as we can here. But uh, we said, if at night a six-foot-tall man is walking away at a rate of three feet per second from an 18-foot-tall lamppost, then how fast is the length of his shadow changing? Okay, so we'll first of all, try to come up with a, a rather clever diagram here. And mine's just very, very primitive. Uh, you can certainly be more elaborate and get a little fancier than mine. But we've got the 18-foot tall lamppost here. And let's say we've got the 6-foot tall man walking in this direction here. He's walking away from the post at a rate of 3 feet per second. So let's define a couple of our variables. I'm going to let x equal the distance from the lamppost to the man. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's let S equal the length of the shadow that's created by the lamppost. So we've got X and S, they represent the respective distances. And now I need to try to come up with some formula that connects and relates all of these variables that, and these quantities that are in play here. So what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing similar triangles. We've got the one big triangle here uh, that has a height of 18 and a base of... Okay, x plus s, that's maybe the sneakiest thing, is just reminding ourselves that the length of that base is x plus s. And then we've got the smaller triangle here that's similar, not congruent, but similar, who has a height of 6 and a base of s. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of the fact that we do have similar triangles, and I'm going to set up a proportion. And I'm going to say something like 6 is to 18, if I compare the height of the smaller one with the height of the larger one. And now I'm just going to be consistent. I'm going to do the base of the smaller one compared to the base of the larger triangle. Uh, I could derive right now. I really could. But that's going to require some messy quotient rule, and I think we could do a lot of cleaning up. So I'm going to cross multiply and get 6x plus 6s equals 18s. Uh, let's see, 6x equals 12s. And uh, you know what? I can even divide the 6 over and say that x is equal to 2 times s. Now we ultimately want the rate at which the shadow's length is increasing or changing, so I need ds dt. So let's derive both sides with respect to time now. dx dt is going to be equal to 2 times ds dt. And I believe that they said that dx dt, the rate at which the man was walking away from the post, was 3 feet per second. So we'll substitute the 3, and then we could solve for ds dt, and we could say, well, the rate at which the shadow is increasing is 3 halves feet per second. And notice that's going to be the same whether he's 10 feet away from the lamppost or 12 feet away from the lamppost. That's going to be a constant rate as he walks away because it didn't really matter. But after When you took the derivative right here, this derivative function was not dependent on the value of x. So the value of x is irrelevant and the rate at which the shadow is changing is always going to be 3 halves feet per second. All right, hope that helps and we are going to tackle some monster related rates tomorrow.